Richard Ramirez, later known as the Night Stalker, was born February 29, 1960 to parents Julian and Mercedes Ramirez. Mercedes' pregnancy with him was a difficult one, having to have multiple injections just so her body wouldn't reject the fetus. It was later speculated that the harmful chemicals Mercedes worked with at her job are what caused the difficult pregnancy. As he got older, Richard Ramirez would notice his father Julian's explosive rage. Once while working on his car, Julian became so angry that he repeatedly bashed his own skull on the side of the house until blood covered his face. Another time, Julian beat himself in the head with a hammer until once again, blood dripped from his skull and onto the ground. One of Richard's siblings in particular, his older brother Reuben, began stealing and robbing houses. This resulted in severe beatings which Richard would witness at only six years old. During his childhood, Richard would have many incidents resulting in head trauma, dressers falling on him, swings hitting him in the head, and would be later diagnosed with epilepsy. In junior high, Richard Ramirez would have a teacher by the name of Ian McMahon who taught children with learning disabilities. As it turned out, Ian McMahon was a child molester who abused two of Richard's brothers for years. Many children who came through the class were also abused by the teacher. Richard would later state that he did not remember being abused by Ian, but that it was possible he blocked it out. Later, his cousin Mike would return home from the Vietnam War. From here, Mike would show pictures to Richard of him S.A.ing and killing women in battle. Mike would show Richard these pictures many times, one picture showing Mike cutting the head off a woman he just assaulted. Richard became fascinated by Mike's stories of S.A. and war killings as well as the pictures. He found that he became more aroused by the pictures of S.A. and death than normal suggestive pictures of woman. Soon he believed it was because he was possessed by Satan. Around this time, he began robbing houses, later stating that he liked being in a stranger's house as it gave him a sense of control. At the age of 13, Richard would witness Mike murder his wife by shooting her in the face. After witnessing this, Richard lost interest in school and continued stealing things. During the summer, Richard would visit his older brother Reuben, who would teach him how to become a master thief, showing him how to break into houses undetected. Little did Reuben know, teaching his younger brother this would aid him in his future murders. That is what we'll be exploring today, the full graphic killings of Richard Ramirez, otherwise known as the Night Stalker. Before I start, consider helping me continue making videos by either buying my full-length novel or donating to my Patreon. I'll be going into more detail about the novel later on. Either way, both links will be in the description of this video. And with that, let's begin. Jenny Vincow On the evening of June 27, 1984, Richard Ramirez crept out the Los Angeles Greyhound bus terminal. Earlier that day, he bought two grams of cocaine from a local drug dealer. Wearing all black, Richard drove his stolen car a few blocks before parking it, walking to an alleyway and eventually injecting the drug into his arm with a needle. The drug flowed through his bloodstream and made its way to his brain. And with that, he got back into his car and made his way down the street, listening to heavy metal. Ramirez drove around in circles before returning to the alleyway and injecting the remainder of the cocaine. From here, he drove around aimlessly through the night before stopping and walking through a graveyard. After passing the tombstones, he came across an apartment building and found an open window. He pried off the screen and entered the home of 79-year-old Jenny Venkow. Once Ramirez had inspected the dark house and ensured that the elderly woman was alone, he crept to her room and pulled out a razor-sharp blade. With his heart pounding, he thrust the knife into her chest. Jenny's eyes flew open and a scream left her mouth. Ramirez continued his stabbing. Jenny continued her screams. It was fruitless. Ramirez placed his hand over her mouth. At this point, he placed his knife to her neck, slitting her throat. Her jugular artery spilled blood like a bursting water balloon. 
Despite this, Ramirez plunged the steel blade into the woman's chest three more times. Once he was finished, he washed his hands in her bathroom sink before stealing her radio and leaving. Later that day, Jack Vincow, son of Jenny, would visit his mother, finding her dead and blood splattered throughout the apartment. Later on, police would dust the entire home looking for fingerprints. They would find four usable prints on the window. Dale Okazaki and Maria Hernandez After his first murder, Ramirez sunk deeper into his cocaine addiction, committing two to three burglaries a day to support the habit. During his downtime, he'd shoot up his cocaine, listen to heavy metal, and watch MTV. Along with this, he'd fantasize about graphic violence, watching the suffering and death of other human beings. At this time, Ramirez felt that demons and even Satan himself protected him from getting arrested. On March 17, 1985, he bought a revolver. Later on, wearing all black, he drove another stolen car on the freeway, looking for someone to kill. Maria Hernandez, driving a gold Camaro, would unfortunately be his target. As she drove, he followed her all the way back to her home on Village Lane. He followed her into her garage, pulled out the revolver, and aimed it at her skull. At that very moment, the garage door closed and the lights automatically went out. He fired at point-blank range. Luckily for her, he missed. Maria took this opportunity to play dead. Ramirez entered the home, walking up the stairs to find Maria's roommate, Dale Okazaki. Dale ducked behind the kitchen counter. Time passed and curiosity got the best of her. She peeked over the counter, wondering if the intruder had left. Ramirez was waiting for her to do this. He pulled the trigger, sending a bullet through her forehead. She fell to the ground, blood leaking from her skull and onto the kitchen floor. As he left through the front door, he spotted Maria. She begged for her life. Pointing his gun at her as he fled, Ramirez let her live and sped off into the night. Before I get too far into this, I'd like to give you a chance to support myself and this channel by purchasing the novel The Junkyard Kids on Amazon. Despite having the word kid in the title, this is not your child's bedtime story. Along with having an intricate plotline and multi-dimensional characters, this is a tale of madness, despair, and some of the most barbaric sides of life someone can experience. After witnessing a serial killer brutally murder his parents, our psychologically disturbed protagonist and his younger brother end up fending for themselves on the streets of an urban wasteland. This in turn leads them to group up with three other unwanted misfits. The five of them eventually seek shelter in an abandoned junkyard on the outskirts of town. If that wasn't bad enough, the group ends up being the witnesses to a murder and our protagonist subsequently killing the murderer in self-defense. With two dead bodies in their decrepit abode in a city filled with corrupt police officials, they decide to dump the bodies in a nearby river. Realizing they'll be caught, the group makes plans to escape the city. Unfortunately, things take a turn when they stumble upon clues to the city's inactive serial killer. Putting their plans of escape on layaway, the group pursues the bloodthirsty murderer. Unfortunately, the serial killer begins his pursuit of them as well. Along with having an awesome cover, also included are over 40 amazing chapter illustrations. As Amazon reader Annie puts it, the story is filled with happenings. It's refreshing to read a story that isn't full of filler. If this book sounds interesting, go ahead and look out for the thumbnail at the end of this video. It'll bring you to a reading of the first few chapters. And if you buy the book and enjoy it, consider leaving a positive review on Amazon. I may just feature your review in one of my videos. A link straight to the book is also in the description of this video. And now, back to the story. Veronica Yu after letting Maria Hernandez live, Ramirez drove onto the freeway, spotting Veronica Yu, a 30-year-old law student born in Taiwan. However, unlike Maria, Veronica would spot his car in the rearview mirror. Sensing danger, she would desperately look for a police car. 
When she didn't find one, she pulled over and Ramirez passed her, looking for another victim. However, Veronica followed him, an action that would be her death knell. Once Ramirez stopped at a red light, he exited his vehicle and walked toward Veronica. After a brief exchange, he attempted to pull her from her driver's side window. Realizing he could not, he ran to the passenger side door and entered her car. Once inside, he shot her. Veronica fled the car. She was shot again and fell to the ground. Bleeding, she pleaded for her life. Ramirez laughed, returned to his car, and sped off toward the freeway. Veronica Yu would die alone on the concrete before police or paramedics arrived. Vincent and Maxine Zazera After his first two killings, Ramirez realized he craved murder even more than cocaine. Along with this, his delusions led him to believe that the more gruesome the murders were, the more it would please Satan. He planned to buy a home for the sole purpose of filming violent tortures and selling the videos on the black market. That's why on March 27th, 1985, he drove to a residence he'd robbed a year previously, the home of Vincent and Maxine Zazera. At 2 a.m. on that night, Ramirez stopped in front of the Zazera home. After breaking inside, he crept through the dark house until finding Mr. Zazera asleep on a couch. Ramirez pulled out his gun, aimed, and then pulled the trigger. A hot piece of metal broke through Mr. Zazera's cranium. Despite this, Mr. Zazera still lunged at Ramirez. However, he soon lost motor function and fell to the ground, blood squirting out and hitting a nearby wall. The sound of the gunshot awoke Mrs. Zazera. A second later, Ramirez was in her room with his gun aimed directly at her. Demanding money, he ordered her on her stomach, gagged, and then bound her. He then began rifling through her belongings. Ramirez was too busy robbing the place to notice Mrs. Zazera had freed herself and now had a gun of her own, a shotgun, and it was pointed right at him. When he turned to face her, she pulled the trigger. Unfortunately, there was no ammunition in that shotgun. Ramirez raised his gun, pulling the trigger three times. Mrs. Zazera fell to the ground. She was then severely beaten. In the mind of Ramirez, her attempt to kill him was an inconceivable sin. He ran to the kitchen, found a 10-inch blade, and rushed back to the room. Mrs. Zazera, already in an immense amount of pain, lay on the ground as Ramirez attempted to cut out her heart. However, the simple kitchen knife wasn't enough to get through her ribcage. And with that, he cut deep into her chest, leaving an inverted cross. After this, he used the knife to peel off her eyelids and then removed her eyes which he put into a jewelry box. Ramirez then plunged the knife into her stomach, throat, and genitals, leaving blood pouring from her body. After this, he gathered up everything he could find that had value, including the shotgun. From here, he left through the front door, soon selling off the goods he had stolen. Eventually, he would make his way back to his hotel room, laughing as he stared into the eyes he removed from Mrs. Zazera. Bill and Lillian Doy On May 14, 1985, 18 days after murdering Mr. and Mrs. Zazera, Ramirez found himself in front of the home of Bill and Lillian Doy. In the early morning hours, he would go straight to the backyard. From there, he cut through the screen of a window and entered the home through the bathroom. Eventually, he would make his way to the room of 66-year-old Bill Doy. Standing in the hallway, Ramirez cocked his gun. The sound woke Mr. Doy, who immediately grabbed his 9mm from the nightstand. Ramirez darted into the room, aimed his gun, and released a bullet right into the face of the elderly man. He attempted to shoot his victim a second time, but his gun jammed. Ramirez ran back into the hallway to clear it. Eventually, he'd return to the room once more. He began violently attacking Mr. Doy, punching and kicking him with no relent. A few moments later, Ramirez would dash to the room of Mrs. Doy, who was in a wheelchair. He slapped her ordering her to stay quiet before robbing their house. Around this time, Mr. Doy woke up, still bleeding profusely. 
Ramirez knocked him unconscious before returning to the room of Mrs. Doy. It was here that he removed her clothing and essayed her, demanding she not look at him throughout the ordeal. Once he was finished, he kissed her before stealing what he could and leaving. Mrs. Doy would live and eventually make a recovery. However, Mr. Doy would be taken to a hospital and be pronounced dead at 5.29 a.m. Mabel Bell and Florence Lang On May 29th, at approximately 11.40 p.m., 83-year-old Mabel Bell and her 81-year-old sister Florence Lang slept in their house, leaving the doors unlocked. Unfortunately, doing this would allow Richard Ramirez to enter the home a short while later. Once in the house, Ramirez would search for valuables but would find none. Angered by this, he made his way to the kitchen for a knife but left with a hammer. While gripping the weapon, he crept to the room of Florence Lang, repeatedly bashing her in the skull with it. Then, he bound her hands with an electrical cord. After this, he went to the room of Maybelle Bell, who was still sleeping. Taking this opportunity, he bashed her skull just as he had with Florence. Once she woke up, he did so again. Her ankles were bound with duct tape. Ramirez retrieved the other end of the electrical cord he used to bind Florence. He plugged it into a wall, shocking Mabel with it. As he did with his other victims, Ramirez went through the house, taking anything he could. At this point, he returned to Florence Lang and essayed her. Once he was finished, he used lipstick to draw pentagrams on the woman's bodies and on the walls of the house. He would then fill a pillowcase with the possessions he'd found and then leave the premises. Florence would survive the attack, but Mabel would later die from her injuries. Carol and Mark Kyle The night after attacking Mabel and Florence, Ramirez drove to Burbank and picked out a house. He crept through the shadows to the backyard before trying the windows and the sliding glass door. Both were locked. It was here that he noticed the dog door. Getting down on the ground, he reached his arm through and then unlocked the door. As soon as he was inside the house, he made his way to the room of 42-year-old Carol Kyle. From here, he woke her up, putting the gun to her head. He asked her who else was in the home, to which she responded her son, Mark. Dragging her from the bed, he took her to the room of the 11-year-old. Soon, Mark and Carol were cuffed together and stuffed into a closet. As the two feared for their lives, Ramirez ransacked the house. Eventually, he dragged Carol from the closet, leaving her son Mark alone. Carol was taken to her room, giving Ramirez the diamond ring around her neck in hopes he would leave. But he didn't. He disrobed her, essaying the terrified widow. Later, she'd state to police, the look in his eyes was absolutely demonic. Never had I seen eyes like his on a human being. Ramirez continued through the house, looking for anything of value but turned up nothing. Dissatisfied, he continued to essay Carol throughout the night. Near morning, he gave Carol a nightgown to cover herself before bringing Mark into the room. Ramirez cuffed the two of them to the bed's headboard before leaving the key in the room in plain sight. This was so Carol's 16-year-old daughter would be able to free them once she returned home. Ramirez then asked Carol for directions to the freeway and then fled the house. At this point in time, Mabel Bell and Florence Lang were still in the same spot he left them. Mary Louise Cannon On the night of July 2nd, 1985, Ramirez would travel to Arcadia and to the home of 75-year-old Mary Cannon. He quickly entered the home through one of the front windows. Creeping through the house, he eventually found the room of the elderly woman. Within an instant, Ramirez grabbed a vase and slammed it against her head. When she screamed, he beat her with his fist. He continued this even after she lost consciousness. Not satisfied, he went to the kitchen before coming back with a knife. Seconds later, he brought it down into her throat and twisted it. He did so again, and again, and again. With blood pouring from her neck, he stole what he could, washed his hands, and then left. Mary Cannon's body would be discovered the next day. Whitney Bennett 
Three days later, on July 5, 1985, Ramirez traveled back to Arcadia. Despite the entire city knowing about him and having sketches of his face, his reasoning was that police wouldn't expect him back in the same location so soon. And so on that night, he drove through the area looking for a target. He discovered from his police scanner that authorities were actively looking for him right then and there. Unfortunately for his next victim, this wasn't enough to stop him. After picking out a house and breaking in, he stole a few items before returning to his car and retrieving a tire iron. He entered the room of Whitney Bennett, put his hand over her mouth, and then struck her in the head 11 times. While she was unconscious, he left the room and found a telephone wire. He then went back to the room and tightly wrapped the cord around her neck, pulling with all his might. A few sparks jumped from the wire, startling Ramirez. It was his belief that this was the power of Christ protecting Whitney from his homicidal rage. With that, he fled the house and spared her life. Whitney would wake up a few hours later covered in her own blood. She was confused due to not remembering the attack. Her face was disfigured and her eyes had been swollen shut. She cried out to her family and eventually received medical assistance. Little did she know, she had just survived an attack from a serial killer. A few sparks from a telephone cord had saved her life. Joyce Nelson Only two days later on July 7, 1985, Ramirez cruised around in another stolen car around Monterey Park. Soon he would break into the home of 61-year-old Joyce Nelson. The elderly woman was asleep on her living room couch with a TV on. Once he was sure that no one else was home, he put a gun to her head and forced her to the bedroom. She resisted. Angered by this, he beat her with his fist until she was unconscious. Ramirez dragged her by her hair to the bedroom before beating her to death. As usual, he would steal what he could and then flee. Sophie Dickman Immediately after murdering Joyce, Ramirez traveled to Hollywood Oak Drive to the home of 63-year-old Sophie Dickman. Like one of his previous victims, he would enter the home by reaching his arm through a doggy door and unlocking the door. From here, he would creep low to the ground until he reached the room of Sophie. He made sure no one else was home, turned on the lights, and then cupped his hand over her mouth. With the elderly woman already terrified, Ramirez put his gun to her head, threatening to kill her if she made a sound. After this, he handcuffed her, put a pillowcase over her head, walked her to the house bathroom, and robbed the place. Eventually, Ramirez would find her hidden stash of diamonds. Sophie attempted to hide her diamond ring which infuriated him. He struck her in the face with his fist. After pocketing the ring, he attempted to SA her but couldn't get an erection. Moments later, he would again search the house for valuables before handcuffing her to the bed. He soon realized there was nothing else he could take and fled. Leela and Maxon Needing Less than two weeks later on July 20th, 1985, Ramirez found himself on the front page of a newspaper. Wanting to outdo himself, he purchased a machete from a nearby knife store. A short time later, he stole a Toyota and drove on the freeway to Glendale. Eventually, he would find himself outside the home of 66-year-old Leela and her 68-year-old husband, Maxon Needing. After breaking into their house, he discovered it was only the elderly couple inside. With that, he went to their bedroom, turned on the lights, and kicked their bed. Before either of them had time to react, Ramirez swung his machete, slicing through the neck of Maxon. When this didn't kill him, Ramirez swung at Leela but missed. He realized his blade wasn't sharp enough and put a gun to Maxon's head, pulling the trigger. The gun jammed. Once he cleared it, he tried again, this time successfully putting a bullet in the brain of the elderly man. As Leela screamed, Ramirez pointed the gun at her and squeezed three times. Her body went limp, blood oozing out of the gunshot wounds. Maxon and Leela were then hacked with a machete. At this time, the police scanner Ramirez had reported shots being fired. 
He swiftly put every valuable thing he could find in a pillowcase, left the house, and sped off on the freeway. Chainarong and Som Kid Covenant. After killing Leela and Max, Ramirez left the freeway and made his way to the home of Chainarong and Som Kid Covenant. He then snuck into the backyard and entered the home through the unlocked sliding glass doors. As soon as he did, Somkid, who was asleep on the living room couch, woke up. Ramirez dashed toward her, cupping his hand over her mouth. He pulled out his gun, put it to her head, and threatened to kill her if she made a noise. With tears streaming down her face, she agreed. Ramirez left her and searched the rest of the house, finding Chainarong. Seconds later, Ramirez put the gun to the head of the Thailand immigrant and pulled the trigger. A bullet fired, going directly into his brain and killing him. At this point, Ramirez retrieved Somkid, bound her arms, and then S-A'd her right next to her dead husband. During the assault, an alarm clock went off in the room of Somkid's eight-year-old son. Ramirez quickly went to the child's room, bound and gagged him, and then went back to Somkid to continue S-A'ing her. Once he was done, he dragged the terrified woman around the house, eventually finding an envelope with rubies, diamonds, and other expensive jewelry. As it turned out, Somkid was the sister of a jeweler. Ramirez demanded cash, but there was none. He took Somkid back into the room and S-A'd her again. He then continued physically assaulting her, convinced that there were more valuables. She eventually gave up one last piece of jewelry. Finally satisfied, Ramirez used a belt to tie her ankles together and left her and her son in the home. Somkid would be left with two concussions, two black eyes, 30 stitches in her mouth, and a dead husband. Chris and Virginia Peterson On August 6, 1985, Ramirez stole a Toyota from a hotel parking lot. After driving on the freeway, he traveled to Northridge. Around 2 a.m., he stopped in front of the home of 38-year-old Chris and 27-year-old Virginia Peterson. Ramirez tried entering first through the front door and then through the windows. Both were locked. By now, the entire surrounding area was aware of his killing spree. Unfortunately, the couple had left their backyard sliding glass doors unlocked. He went in through there, pulled out his gun and crept low to the ground. As he went throughout the house, he cocked his gun. The noise woke Virginia. Ramirez then entered the room, aimed his gun, and shot her below her eye. She fell. In her shock, she believed that she'd been hit by a stun gun. Chris woke up from the noise, thinking it was an elaborate prank until he saw the blood and bullet wound on his wife's face. Ramirez fired a shot at Chris, hitting him in the temple. Fortunately for Chris, the bullets were old. The gunpowder within them no longer had the potency they once had. And with that, they weren't able to break through the skull of the warehouse manager. Ramirez fired another shot, aiming for Virginia. He missed. Chris rose from his bed, charging at Ramirez who then fired his last two bullets, missing once again. Knowing he wouldn't win the fight, the Night Stalker dashed through the sliding glass doors and off into the night. Chris drove himself and his family to Northridge Hospital. There it would be discovered that the bullet that hit Virginia had traveled through the roof of her mouth, into her throat, and made its way out the back of her neck. Both would survive, and Virginia would give police a description of Ramirez. Sakina and Elias Aboeth Within the two days following his attack on Chris in Virginia, Ramirez would buy an Uzi machine gun from a dealer he'd met at a bus terminal. Firing 30 rounds per second, he'd be better equipped to defend himself from any unforeseen threats. On August 8th, he stole a car and began his usual venture onto the freeway, heading to Diamond Bar and then to the house of Sakina and Elias Aboeth. Ramirez entered through their sliding glass door and then went about the house, finding out who was home. Besides Elias and Sakina, he found their two boys, aged 3 and 10 weeks. He exited the house and then parked his car right in their driveway for a quicker escape. Then he returned to the bedroom, putting his gun to the head of Elias. Without hesitation, he pulled the trigger. Elias died instantly. Ramirez wasn't finished. 
He hopped over the dead body, rushing towards Sakina. Here, he repeatedly punched her in the face and stomach. Eventually, he blindfolded and gagged her with a shirt. The shirt would be pushed so far into her mouth that part of it entered her throat, causing her to choke. When she tried to stop him, he slapped her, threatening to kill her. He bound her ankles, struck her in the head four times, and then searched the house for anything he could sell for quick cash. Once he found what he wanted, he dragged Sakina into another room and S-A'd her. Unfortunately, during this time, Sakina's three-year-old son would interrupt the attack after finding his father's dead body. Ramirez grabbed the terrified child, tied him up, put a pillowcase over his head, and then continued to S.A. Sakina. Eventually, he'd finish and look out the window outside, seeing a police cruiser pull up near the house. Preparing for a shootout, he pulled out his Uzi. However, the cruiser soon left. After finding nothing more of value, he took Sakina back into her bedroom, again essaying her next to her dead husband. Ramirez finished, grabbed what he could, and left. Following this, Sakina grabbed her son and told him to go wake up his father. She was under the impression that he was only unconscious. Unfortunately, the realization eventually hit her when the toddler couldn't wake up his father. Peter and Barbara Pan Fast forward to August 18th, Ramirez took a stolen Mercedes-Benz to San Francisco and checked himself into the Bristol Hotel. After stopping at a 24-hour porno shop, he smoked a joint and then drove to Chinatown. Here, Ramirez would attack an elderly woman, rob a house, and then head back to his hotel room. Upstairs, he would find 66-year-old Peter Pan and his 62-year-old wife, Barbara, both immigrants from Hong Kong. Ramirez didn't hesitate to put his gun to the head of Peter and pull the trigger. His victim died instantly. Barbara was then physically assaulted. She resisted his SA and then was shot in the head. Ramirez did not spend much time here, taking what he could and then leaving. Barbara would survive the attack but would be disabled for the rest of her life. Bill Carnes and Inez Erickson on August 24th, Ramirez was back in LA. However, with the insane bounty on his head, he shied away from his usual hunting grounds. The city was in uproar at this point. Bars had been placed over windows and people had grown suspicious of each other. Even with this, homicidal thoughts still ran through the mind of the Night Stalker. He would attempt an attack on 13-year-old James Romero Jr. and his family, but would abort the attack when they chased him off. Later into the night, he'd break into the home of 29-year-old Bill Carnes and his 27-year-old fiancée Inez Erickson. Soon, he'd make his way to their bedroom. Bill woke up to the sight of the Night Stalker's flashlight and jumped out of bed. Ramirez pulled the trigger, sending a bullet into the man's head. He stepped forward, shooting him in the skull two more times. Ramirez then pulled the covers back to reveal Inez and then confessed that he was the Night Stalker. As she pleaded, he beat her in the face with his fist. He would tie her up and demand jewelry and cash. After finding some, he took Inez into the other room and S-A'd her. Once he was done, he again demanded more valuables, eventually taking $400 and leaving. Both Bill and Inez would survive the ordeal. However, Bill would be left paralyzed on the left side of his body and suffer from memory issues. To this very day, one of the three bullets is still lodged in his brain. The Arrest of Richard Ramirez Upon leaving the house of Bill and Inez, he would be spotted by James Romero Jr., the same 13-year-old boy Ramirez attempted to attack earlier. James would write down the first three characters of the license plate number and then had his parents contact police. Regarding Ramirez, he would eventually get rid of the car and take a bus to Chinatown, renting out a hotel room. Later on, police would find the fence of Ramirez, the term fence meaning a man who buys stolen goods. Once they entered the home of the fence, a man named Solano, they would discover stolen property from the homes of the attacks. Along with this, detectives would discover the full license plate number of the vehicle James Romero had seen. The car would be found abandoned in Chinatown. 
Eventually, detectives would interview a man named Armando who witnessed Ramirez picking up jewelry from a mutual friend. After threatening to charge Armando with accessory to murder, he finally cracked and gave up his friend's last name. And soon, they would get a tip that someone matching the description had been staying at the Bristol Hotel in room 315. However, he wasn't there. Police soon took a fingerprint found on the mirror of the car he stole and flew it to Sacramento, eventually identifying it as coming from Richard Ramirez. His mugshot from a previous crime and full name were handed off to the press. At this point, there was a nationwide manhunt. His face was on every television set and his name came through the speakers of every radio. On August 30th, Ramirez boarded a Greyhound bus and headed to Arizona to visit his brother. At this time, he was unaware of the nationwide manhunt. Once he arrived to Arizona, police were swarming the bus terminal. This making him uncomfortable, Ramirez left and ended up buying a ticket back to LA. Police knew he had a brother in Arizona and suspected he would attempt to flee there. Luckily for him, no one thought he would be returning to LA. And so, Ramirez went through the terminal, passing police undetected. Later that day, he would see his face plastered all over the newspapers outside a liquor store. The store owner soon called the police. However, by that time, Ramirez was on the run. He sprinted down the street, darted through 70 mile per hour traffic on the freeway, and hopped on a bus. Unfortunately for him, all the other passengers already knew who he was. With that, the bus stopped and he got off. His plan was to steal a car and flee to Mexico where he wouldn't be noticed. However, everywhere he went, people knew who he was. Escape at this point was next to impossible. That is until he saw a woman sitting alone in a car and got in. After arguing with her to leave the vehicle, the woman's boyfriend and another man chased him off. Ramirez bolted to an alleyway and eventually to Hubbard Street. Unfortunately for him, the Mexican-American citizens of this community knew of his crimes and of his face and name. They were proud, hard-working people and were not pleased with what he had done. After running through backyards and attempting several car thefts, he would be chased out of the neighborhood by an angry mob. Eventually, a man named Manuel de la Torre would hit Ramirez over the head with a metal bar. Ramirez would be held there by the mob until police arrived. And so ended the Night Stalker's reign of terror. Richard Ramirez would be arrested on August 31st, 1985 and after trial, he would be given the death sentence. However, he would die of complications related to B-cell lymphoma on June 7th, 2013. He would die alone in a bed, most likely never showing remorse for his attacks. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure you check out my other videos or subscribe to see content related to this. Also, if you're interested in the novel I mentioned earlier, click the thumbnail on screen now to hear a sample reading of it. That's all I have for now. See you next time.